we're going to do it one more time. So, uh, good evening! Good evening! That, that is always more like it. So I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, thank you for braving the uh, bad weather. Uh, and uh, I'm going to make it illegal for there to be bad weather one day. Uh, and uh, we'll, see, we'll see if that works. But I just want to thank all of you for coming out. We uh, do this for you, and we have the privilege of working for you. Uh, this is a uh, cell phones out type event, so you're welcome to take pictures, you're welcome to take notes, you're welcome to send emails to friends. Uh, you can participate using Twitter or Facebook or Instagram to tell folks about some of the things that you're hearing today, and we're hoping that you'll share the message out there. This is our fourth annual town hall, and it's an opportunity to hear from all of the agencies up here uh, about uh, different issues. Uh, of course, I've been trying to reduce the waste, and so you'll be able to pick up your uh, free reusable bag on the way out. Uh, we'll be giving out, uh, uh, if we haven't already, your evaluation forms. We want to be better and better every year. I, I know I'm perfect, but I still think there's room for improvement. Uh, and so that, that also is a little bit of jest uh, there. Uh, I want to thank Memorial Stone Kettering for uh, hosting us each year for this and our uh, state of the district. Uh, for you, that's going to be in January. I also want to uh, recognize, I think, yes, we, we've been joined by Assemblymember Seawright's office uh, with uh, Courtney from our office, and they do a great job. And Courtney's going to wave to folks. And so, if you, and please give her a quick round for being here and just uh, anything from the state. Uh, Courtney is your person who will work with Assemblymember Seawright. We try to do as much as we can here, but uh, there is a state and uh, they, they have more control over the city than they wish, wish they did. I like Rebecca, but uh, there's legislators after in Buffalo who get to decide how much your rent is. And I don't think that's uh, right. I've lived in Buffalo and rent is very different from Buffalo. We, this event is also sponsored by Congressmember Maloney, State Senator Liz Kruger, and Borough President Gail Brewer, and Councilmember. Uh, Dan uh, if this is your idea of fun and you want to actually get to participate a little bit more, the first Friday of every month, uh, except on Jewish holidays, uh, and uh, this coming October, the Friday, anyone know which holiday we got on that Friday? Well, no, nope. Rosh Hashanah is uh, Thursday, Yom Friday Yom this week. What? Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the following week. <laughs> So it's Sukkot, which is the festival of tents. And it's, uh, when uh, people in my faith, we, we put up these uh, uh, four-sided buildings, you'll be able to find them in John Jay Park, as well as on the Esplanade. We work with the uh, local Chabad to do so, and sometimes we do silly things like try to sleep in them in this weather, uh, which is not so bad for September. Uh, and I do believe in global warming, and so uh, there is that. We also do brainstorming with Ben. That's the second Tuesday of every month. That's at 6 o'clock, and that's for folks who may have an idea on how to improve uh, our city, how to improve our uh, whole country as we know it. And so uh, anyone here subscribe to the Wall Street Journal? So please take a look at it tomorrow. Uh, something you may have noticed in our event, which is right here, is free child care provided upon request. We've been doing this for a couple of uh, years at this point, and I introduced legislation uh, for he for she for tomorrow, I am a he for she. I like to. Uh, I'm, I'm a feminist, and so what it says is if you need child care, and my parent was a single mom, and 80% uh, of single parents are moms, and so something that we did with somebody through a uh, brainstorming with Ben is we are introducing legislation on the 27th, and anytime the government has a meeting where you're invited to participate, like you are tonight you'll be able to request child care. So if you need that, please let us know. Also, at our office, we do clinics. Uh, we have clinics on housing, so you can talk to a lawyer for free. We can help you with life planning. Uh, we also, because it happens in every single community, we have folks to help you if you have a family law issue, uh, or God forbid, if you're dealing with a domestic violence situation, we can help you with housing, divorce, you name it. We just want to make sure that you or anyone you may know is in a safe situation. We also do mobile hours where we can come to you. And of course, uh, last but not least, you don't have to come to us. That's that's boring. I make house calls. 
Uh, you can find doctors that make house calls, God bless you, but I will show up at your house, just gather 10 people for bending your building, and uh, generally that way that works is I'll show up at your co-op board meeting uh, or your annual meeting. I grew up in a co-op, the only time I saw my neighbors was at the annual meeting. And so uh, the format for tonight is that uh, we will have a lot of our different agencies. So the roster will be uh, Department of Education to talk about pre-K, MTA to talk about buses, um, and uh, uh, we also uh, have uh, Parks and Recreation to talk about the Esplanade construction, uh, which is a good thing because we used to not have an Esplanade that used to be falling into the river, still falling into the river, but now it's closed, which people are complaining about because they're doing the work. Um, we are working on trying to figure out a way to uh, fix the Esplanade without closing it and without having to do the construction, but uh, we'll, we'll figure that out one day. But uh, construction is a good thing, and just making sure it stays on track. A lot of people in the neighborhood express concerns about uh, immigrants. Uh, as folks may know, my grandparents were immigrants. They came here from Eastern Europe, uh, for any anti-Semitism. Uh, and uh, since anti-Semitism is just an old thing, it's old, over and done with, and again, that sarcasm. Uh, my wife actually fled anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union uh, in, in my generation, in her generation. So uh, this is, a, and if you've been to my State of the District or my inauguration, uh, Herman E. Muller's speech about the first day came for, and there was no one left to speak for me, is something I believe in. So we have Office of Immigrant Affairs to talk about what you can do to resist what the city is doing around the president's DACA order and uh, what we can do to help those among us to make sure that they're welcomed. And then we'll be wrapping up with the fire department who will tell you about the free fire alarm and just safety precautions. And I'm hoping folks will stay till the end because we have more fires in our district each winter than we probably should. And I want to make sure that everyone in this room is safe and that their neighbors are safe and that you know about all the great uh, programs. I also want to just uh, note that we're also joined uh, by Scott Stringer, our controller's office. Uh, Mike Stinson, and if Mike can raise his hand and wave, and he's right there, so if you have any questions about how the city is spending uh, your money or your city's pension, uh, please make sure to uh, touch base with him. Uh, and I think one other thing to, to note is uh, I do this all alone. There's just me. There's only me. Uh, and that's also another joke. Sorry for my bad delivery. Don't pay attention to anyone behind the curtain, and those folks would be... Uh, my chief of staff, Jesse Towson. We have uh, my scheduler and event pro person, Isabel Smith, who put together this event. And we have our graduate students in social work. We have interns. And we have a great team. And we can give them a quick round of applause. So that we can hear that time. And uh, so we've been busy. A lot has happened over the past month. We can't tell you about it because we're in election season and there's a blackout. We can only tell you about events. You can read about it on our website at benkalos.com uh, slash newsletter. Uh, well, it's, it's right here. And uh, so we have our annual town hall. Please make sure to stop by our uh, emergency preparedness uh, program. On September 27th, we'll be giving away free go bags. Uh, we launched the Roosevelt Island Ferry Service. Uh, we are continuing to fight the bus service cuts. We'll hear a little bit from MTA about where we were. You may have noticed the bus clocks throughout the neighborhood. Did anyone notice those? So that's your dollars. You voted for a participatory budgeting. Those are now going in. If you want one, please make sure to touch base with our office. We passed a right to counsel for tenants, and we also passed uh, protection so that if your landlord is doing construction, that never ends. That's now harassment, and we have to make, and we can make sure that gets done. We opened Cornell Tech, and uh, we are having a hearing later this month on noise. Who here is concerned about how loud construction is in the neighborhood? So we've been getting that complaint. Uh, if any of you have ever been to First Friday, I'll tell you the worst thing I can do for you is legislation. The best thing I can do is actually fix the problem. Uh, but uh, what we've done is we've introduced legislation. We're saying that commercial neighborhoods and residential neighborhoods should have different decibel levels. So uh, right now, it's about the sound of, I'd say, a, a jet taking off. So you can have a jet taking off across the street from your house for four years of construction, and that's okay. And I'm saying it shouldn't be that. It should be more of a uh, vacuum cleaner. 
if somebody's vacuuming next door, I think you can handle that. But somebody taking off the jet next door is not quite there. We're doing a hearing, and if you're interested. Uh, before I forget or get in trouble with my staff, if you have questions, uh, what's going to happen is each presenter is going to come up. They're going to speak to five to ten minutes. And uh, then they'll take about five to ten minutes of questions. The format is because a lot of the times a lot of folks have the same questions is we have index cards. So my team is going to start handing them out if they haven't already. And so they're going to start coming around with those index cards. And we have all pencils too. And you can take that too. And uh, when you are ready, uh, you can just hold up the index card and we will take it from you. And if you hold up an empty hand, we will hand you an index card. Please try to get them in as people are making their presentations. And uh, I think that is it. And I hope to wrap up by uh, 8 o'clock tonight so that we can all go home and have a great dinner. Um, and so tonight we start off with the outreach director for Pre-K for All, uh, John Tripp, who I've had the pleasure of working with over the past three or four years in various different capacities, as well as director of school expansion, Stephanie Crane. Stephanie spends every other Tuesday on the phone with my office as we discuss what we can do to bring more pre-K seats to the Upper East Side. Uh, as many of you know, when UPK initially launched, there was a shortage of seats on the Upper East Side of Roosevelt Island, requiring many four-year-olds to go all the way to the financial district for pre-K. And uh, we've been spending a lot of time with the mayor and this team right here trying to fix it. And we've gotten from 123 seats in 2014 up to uh, over 600. We will get the updated number tonight of how many we are because they always find new seats. Uh, as folks may have read about, and we're hoping to have an official launch. Uh, we will be getting a new pre-K center on 76th Street uh, with um, some seats. And so there's some minimal coverage in DNA info and other places, but we're really waiting to do a big uh, event to announce the great seats and hope to have even more. But without further ado, if you can join me in welcoming uh, John and Stephanie. Okay. <coughs> Hello, good evening. I want to thank the council member and his team for having us here this evening. Again, my name is uh, John Tripp. I'm the director of outreach for the pre-K team. But now our portfolio also includes the exciting new free k initiative, and the Burma Learning Programs across the city. And I'm Stephanie Cranes. I'm the director of the Pre-K and now Pre-K Expansion team, looking to find uh, seats across the city um, that are accessible to families for our four-year-olds and three-year-olds. So we're happy to take a couple minutes tonight to kind of go over the, the Pre-K program, explain how it works, um, and then answer any questions you might have. Uh, this is a program we're entering our fourth year. September 7th was the first day of school and which began the fourth year of Pre-K for All in New York City. So now, year over year, we serve about 70,000 students. In the past, Pre-K was just means tested and served about 18,000 students annually. So the expansion was um, large. We're now, again, at year 70,000 year over year. Um, but there's still work to do. And one of the important pieces of the work to make Pre-K successful every year is to get out in the community and explain how the process works to families and help families find the program that works best for them. So there's about 1,850 pre-K programs across the city. There's an application process which begins in the early part of every year. So around January of every year, the application process starts. And the great thing about pre-K for all is that there's really just two qualifications for your child to be a part of it. That's your child needs to be born in the applicable year. So for this current school year, the child had to be born in 2013 and you need to live in the five boroughs of New York City. That's it. So if you meet those two qualifications, 2013 born, and you live in the five boroughs, um, you're eligible, your child is eligible for pre-K for all. Um, it's easy to find out about how the application process works. When we're done here today, I can leave some information on the front tables that you can take home and you can access online. We have a bunch of online tools. But also, there's a, there's a, my team, um, gets out in the community all across New York and actually works with families to try to find programs that work for them. So we um, have, we've, you know, as, as the council member mentioned, uh, we've been working very hard over the last few years to identify space in the Upper East Side to find new programs and offer new, new choices for families. And that's work that continues. Um, so we've been working very hard to do that and we'll continue to do that 
uh, to make sure we meet the needs of every family in, in the city. So there are seats that are still available across the city. Um, not nearly as many as available um, at the beginning of every year, um, but the pre-K finder, the map that's online can show those filtered seats. Um, so happy to answer any questions folks might have, but again, the application process for the 2018-2019 school year will be starting um, early next year. Uh, so there'll be big public information that kind of goes over that and will be in the Upper East Side and in the, in the council members district making sure families are aware of, of the whole process when we get a little closer uh, to that launch. Additionally, there's going to be new program directories that will be alive online and new hard copies uh, that will be distributed across the city which will go over the program choices and we expect to have those available at the end of this calendar year. And to, to build upon on the other side, so John and his team is out in, this, out in the community making sure families um, and, and children have the awareness of where pre-K programs exist. On my end, um, in an area where I've been working really closely with a council member and his team, is making sure we have seats in areas that our families really need them, where they're accessible, and, and families are opting in to, to choose those seats. So in this particular council district, we continue to work to seek uh, space to create additional pre-K seats for all of our families um, in a way that is most convenient for them. In this council district, in this general area, um, we have pre-K seats available in a variety of settings. We have them in our district schools. Um, in some cases, we have pre-K there that ensures the continuity across grades. We also partner with our community-based organizations that we call the New York City Early Education Centers to offer the free full-day pre-K um, to families who would like to be served in that setting, and then a newer type of setting that we have available are called our pre-K centers, uh, which is, is in some cases are standalone buildings where we serve pre-K, and other cases are housed in existing district school buildings. Um, and the exciting announcement that the council members shared briefly um, is around the upcoming use of a standalone building to serve 10 sections of pre-K, 180 seats in the September 2019 year. So where we have some temporary seats available, we look to create permanent capacity to make sure there are options for our families in a long-term um, long manner. And I think we continue to have a really close partnership with our um, superintendent, Bonnie LaVoy, and work with her team and principals to find seats and you know, ensure that our principals are supported in creating those programs. Additionally, we have a, an RFP, which is a request for proposal, our invitation for community-based organizations to work with us. Open right now, it's been open throughout the course of the summer. In the event that programs that offer some of these services would like to contract with us and create a more in-depth portfolio of those seats. Um, so we really continue to pursue all creative options to make sure as many seats as each community needs, we are able to provide those seats. We'd be remiss to mention the city's new 3K for All program. Um, that program launched this year for the first time. This is a universal program for three-year-olds. So in many cities, you know, preschool is preschool threes and preschool fours. So here in New York City, we're going to have, or excuse me, pre-kindergarten, we'll have pre-kindergarten for threes. It started in two districts this year, District 7 in the South Bronx and District 23 in Central Brooklyn and Brownsville. It's going to be a two-year rollout per district. So by next year, we will think we'll be at capacity for District 7 and 23, but we'll be announcing two new districts every year for the next four years, so we get to eight districts, with the goal being then we will secure funding to go citywide so all 32 districts have, um, have that. So we, we, we have seen uh, strong success in District 7 and 23 this year. We're very encouraged by it. We expect the same success to happen in the next several districts. Uh, the announcements will be made in the, in the, future, in the not too distant future, um, and this is, I think, a program that will benefit the entire. This is certainly a program that's going to benefit the entire city. Um, but we're going to, you know, push hard to make sure we secure that funding from the state and federal government. We'd be happy to answer any questions. So at this time, if you have any questions for DOE, just if you can hold up your card. Uh, so we have that, and we're going to take that down. So seeing one or two questions for DOE, so I will make sure to ask them. Uh, I think first one, just thank you for the 180 seats. Those go live in 2019. Uh, are, where are we for 2018 in terms of more seats, and how many? So yes, where are we? First question is, 
How many seats do we currently have for this year on the Upper East Side? Yeah. Um, so this year, as we look at, and again, often we find that uh, it, it differs on how the definition is, but looking at um, the zip codes uh, 10075, 10128, 10065, 10021, and 10028, as well as a portion of Midtown East. Um, for the current school year, we have approximately um, 525 seats. Specifically, the council district that Council Member Kalos represents, we have about 553 seats. Right. So, uh, and so, you've identified essentially 10 classes, 180 seats for 2019. You've identified 550 now. I'm going to keep that paper if you'll let me. How many? What, what, is, what are you doing for 20, this coming school year, 2018? Sure thing. So one thing that is, we're currently working on right now is we have an RFP out, so our request for proposals, where we invite community-based providers to partner with us and utilize some of the existing space um, that they, in which they serve different community members to open pre-K for all programs. Additionally, we're kicking off our planning cycle with the superintendent. Um, to get a strong understanding of what may work within our district school buildings to offer pre-K and to plan, uh, plan accordingly from there. And then the other pieces, we continue to partner with the school construction authority. I think council member and his team have shared some potential real estate ideas with us um, and we've continued to share that directly with school construction authority and ask them to review the specific logistics of those spaces suggested. And so we continue to work closely, and uh, the council member has our information, so where there are other ideas, um, your community-based organization that you are connected to or have some space ideas, we're happy to, to hear from you, uh, willing to be creative in order to create uh, all the seats that we need in partnership with folks in this room. Okay. So this is, a couple of parents have asked this and somebody in the audience asked. So. Um, it seems like some of the seats on the Upper East Side are serving lots of kids from all over the city. How are seats allocated and dispersed through the district? And how many seats in the new 76 seat center or even in the current seats will go to children in this district versus uh, kids from all over the city? So I can actually review how the priority structure works for entry into a program. Um, you, you do have the right to apply to a pre-K program anywhere in the city, so again, it's 1,850 program, or approximately 1,850, but everyone has the right to apply. That said, there's a priority structure when how and families are chosen. So I'll just review that. Um, so first and foremost. So, so in the pre-K guide, where can they find this? Yeah, so this is online. So again, I'm gonna leave palm cards that'll get you to the website, nyc.gov slash pre-K. But just in short, the first priority is for families who live in a zone, they have a zone school and you have a sibling going, older sibling going to that zone school, you have the first priority. Second priority would be, do you live in that zone school? Third priority would be, do you have a sibling that lives in the district going to the district school? I mean, sorry, a sibling going to that district program. Um, then the fourth priority would be, do you live in the district? And it goes from there. So the point is, there's, is there's potential that somebody's at some program that's from outside of that district. Um, the potential exists, I'd say, for the vast majority of cases on the Upper East Side because of the seat constraints, it's highly unlikely that it's more than just an individual case here and there. Yep. And in terms of the pre-K center that is coming online in the September 2019, the start of the September 2019 school year, um, there's 10 sections, 180 seats. Uh, pre-K center priority, it works for, it prioritizes in-district families first and then out-of-district families second. So depending on what the application looks like, it's you know largely going to be in-district folks, uh, but that depends on how many people in total apply to the pre-K center. Um, pre-K centers differ just a bit slightly in that there are no zones for them, but really trying to uh, provide priority to families who live within uh, the community school district. Uh, we have a specific question around uh, how DOE does quality control and uh, how residents can raise concerns about quality of specific programs. Uh, for the person who filled out the card, I don't know, but if you touch base with our office uh, or anyone has any concerns about pre-K or any other program that is a DOE program, please make sure to let our office know so we can uh, bring it to DOE's attention and work with you to get it resolved. But what are you doing proactively around quality control? 
Sure. So there are a couple of different pieces um, that we use and want to make sure that quality information is also available to families. So one thing we rolled out this year is if you have access to the pre-K finder online, you can check out as you look at schools that may be options for you um, within the details. There is what is called the pre-K quality snapshot. And there we use information that we've gotten from families as well as some of our assessment tools to summarize what we're seeing at a given program. So we use two early childhood specific assessments. One is called Eckers and one is called CLASS, which look at, looks at what's happening in the classroom, what is the environment like, what are the interactions like between students to students, students to teacher, and across the school community, specific as well to the pre-K class. And then we also take into account what we're hearing from parents in surveys to really get the lay of the land in terms of what we're seeing at each program. Um, and, and we can go into a lot more detail about the different tools we use. But if you do see any issues at a given site, you can uh, reach out to us and we'll share this as follow-up. But early childhood policy at, at schools.nyc.gov and anything that comes in through that inbox, we make sure to respond to quickly and follow up to make sure that we are understanding a given concern of school. And, and I can talk specifically to the person who wrote this after to make sure that we capture whatever feedback you may have. And, and so we will be asking uh, John and Stephanie to step out afterwards. We'll be setting them home and then bring up the next folks, but they will be available briefly outside the <coughs> auditorium to answer any quick questions. And then we have another similar quality question around parochial schools. So some of you may know that uh, largely the city is pushing for full day pre-K. However, in, in some communities, uh, parochial schools have been able to get a half day pre-K program versus a full day because the city can't cover the religious instruction piece, which we don't. Uh, how do you ensure quality is part of a half-day program when the other half of the day they may be getting religious instruction? So in our half-day programs, we use similar assessment tools. So for the portion of the day that is contracted by the city, the half-day, we use similar assessment tools. Additionally, in addition to the assessment piece, we also also have support staff in the form of instructional coordinators and social workers who look at each program, who visit regularly to offer support, and in the event issues are flagged, to work with the school leadership, the site leadership, to ensure progress and change in those areas. Um, so though we don't work in the hours that are outside of our contracted day, we use similar tools and supports to make sure those programs are high quality and supporting families in the way that um, we expect programs to be serving our communities. Okay. Uh, I, I will mention it because of, uh, not sure if they can. One of the, I, I was not thrilled that we lost pre-K seats going into this year. I think we have fewer now than we did last time. But part of it is that some of the providers did get complaints as far as I understand. So they were discontinued as providers. So they're still available for private sector, but no longer through the universal pre-K program. Uh, so I think just in terms of the quality control issues, whether I like it or not, we've lost seats because of the quality control that they have done. And as your council member, and I feel free to talk to me directly too, we've decided not to push DOE to say, we don't care, we need the seats to keep it open even if it isn't a quality program. So at, at, at having lost seats, I was comfortable with having lost those seats because I wanted to make sure every child had a quality seat. So I want to thank uh, John and Stephanie, if you could give them a quick round. We really thank the council members' strong partnership. Uh, we, we go out around the city and work really hard to try to get the word out. The council member has been really great for us to help uh, work closely to inform with families. So it's made our life. Thank you. And if you have an idea for location, uh, if you have an idea for location, please do uh, make sure to touch base with our office and uh, DOE. Um, and just one key item: we, we kind of report everything. If you go to YouTube.com/slash/NYC, you can watch. All our town halls going back in time. Uh, it will help you with your insomnia. But um, <laughs> the uh, thing is just, we'll, we're continuing to read through, but please know that all this is recorded and will be available. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Zachary Campbell, who's filling in for Marcus Book. Uh, who here uh, rode a bus to get here tonight? Okay, and who here has ridden a bus in the last week? <laughs> And uh, we love our buses here on the Upper East Side. Uh, we're a little bit bummed out with the UN General Assembly because it means that the buses can't get past the UN to serve us at the moment. Uh, but uh, 
So Marcus uh, was sick, but we uh, brought him in. The MTA carries <coughs> over 8 million daily riders between subways, buses, Long Island Railroad, Metro North, uh, and uh, many of us. Um, we've been able to work with DOT to bring select bus service to the M86, to the M79, uh, which has increased performance. We've also added the bus box throughout the district. We've also added additional trains to the queue line, uh, which uh, I think is up to 200,000 riders a day. Uh, and it's, yeah, absolutely. And we're working with capital construction to make sure that every single thing is done. If there's anything that wasn't the way it was or better than when it started, please let us know, but not Zach. And so uh, <laughs> we, we brought Zach here to just talk about uh, bus and, and subway service. And uh, if you can join me in welcoming Zach, and please, as you have your questions ready, for especially for MTA, just raise your hand, and uh, we will uh, make sure to get you that. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us today. Take off your coats. They are. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it was raining out. I was outside for a bit today. Um, so I'm just going to do a very quick. Wait, sorry. One last question. Sure. Uh, can everyone hear? Okay, uh, so and is it it's okay up here, or do we have to lean into the mic so you can hear? Lean in. Okay. Lean in. Lean in. Here we go. Uh, so just a very quick uh, update on our subway action plan, uh, which many people may have heard of. Uh, before we get to the Q and A, just wanted to say if you have not heard of it um, and do not know what it is that we're doing, we're trying to address a lot of the key issues with subway service. Um, and I know that we just talk buses, but, uh, but I have to plug this. If you haven't seen it, mtamovingforward.com. Uh, that's mtamovingforward.com. Uh, it talks about a variety of different things that we're looking to do, both the short and the uh, longer term, to try to address some of the subway service issues. Uh, and with that, I think it's best to just open it up to questions. Yeah. Keep it simple. service to M57. Can you explain to us and folks in the audience 